Well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 19th uh, 15th meeting of 2017. Uh, Ian, uh, Lee MacArthur has indicated he's been delayed at Kirkwall Airport, but hopes to join us later this morning. Agenda item number one is consideration of the Criminal Finance Bill Legislative Consent Memorandum. This is a supplementary memorandum as a result of amendments to the bill being tabled at Westminster. Our aim is to report to the Parliament on the supplementary memorandum in time for the relevant motion being taken. We understand the motion will be taken at decision time this afternoon, so obviously time is extremely limited, but we'll do what we can in that time to scrutinise it. Um, can I welcome uh, Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and his officials, Linda Hamilton, Deputy Director, Defence, Security and Cyber Reliance, Alistair Creerer, Head of Organised Crime Policy, and Craig French, Director of Legal Services um, with the Scottish Government. I refer members to Paper 1, which is noted by the Clerk, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Thank you, uh, Convener. I'll try to keep my introductory remarks uh, brief. Uh, first of all, I'd like to explain the exhilarated timescale that we are uh, now find ourselves working uh, to with this particular LCM. The uh, Criminal Finance Bill has always had a tight legislative timetable and the Prime Minister's decision to hold a UK general election on the 8th of June has uh, forced the process to be expedited further. While this may be unsatisfactory, uh, the Scottish Government is keen to see the provisions in the Bill apply in Scotland and is supportive of the supplementary legislative consent motion being agreed in line with those exhilarated timescales and in advance of the dissolution of the UK Parliament. The Bill is intended to strengthen the capabilities and powers that law enforcement agencies and partners have to recover uh, the proceeds of crime, tackling money laundering and corruption and counter-terrorism financing. The Scottish Government shares those objectives. Indeed, in our programme for government for 2016-17, we committed to pressing the UK government to strengthen proceeds of crime legislation, including enabling the police to seize betting, slips and casino chips from criminals. And it is good to see those changes now being delivered. The committee has previously considered and reported on the original LCM alongside uh, my letter to you of the 20th January and 24th February and Parliament voted to pass the original motion on the 2nd of March. The supplementary LCM sets out relevant amendments that have been tabled since my letter of the 24th of February. This is probably a good moment to confirm that the possible amendment to Clause 51 uh, which is now uh, Clause 53, the power to make consequential provisions, uh, which I referred to in the supplementary LCM, has now been lodged by Home Office Ministers and will be considered by the House of Lords today. In addition, an amendment to Part 10 of the Proceeds of Crime Act around information sharing, uh, which were flagged up in my letter of the 24th of February, and again in the supplementary LCM, have been expanded to include information sharing about two additional aspects of civil, civil recovery, recovery of listed assets and forfeiture of bank accounts. I now make it clear that the proceeds of crime-related uh, information can be shared with HMRCS, uh, HMRC and the Financial Conduct Authority. These amendments, uh, like the Bill as a whole, are intended to further strengthen and improve the recovery of the proceeds of crime, and I would encourage the Committee to support them. I would like to finish, of course, by thanking the Committee for agreeing to consider this supplementary memorandum at such short notice and helping to ensure that a vote can take place in Parliament this afternoon on the supplementary motion. Hey, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. John Finney. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, uh, some very positive uh, enhancements to the position we were in earlier. C could you comment, please, on the Magnitsky Amendment and how it's likely to manifest itself? Well, uh, Clause 12 of the Magnitsky Amendment, which is included within the uh, Criminal Finance uh, Bill, 
uh, was voted on on the 21st of February. Uh, what the amendment intends to do is that it will allow uh, for uh, proceedings to be taken forward here within uh, Scotland or the UK against an individual who may have uh, been associated with uh, breaches of human rights in another country. Uh, so, for example, if they have been involved in a process that's involved the abuse of uh, human rights in another foreign country and they are living here in Scotland or elsewhere in the UK uh, and uh, their lifestyle, again, uh, is not reflective of the, uh, uh, what we would expect someone, given their tax returns in this country, it will allow our law enforcement agencies to be able to take action against them and to pursue uh, those assets. Uh, given that they may be associated with the, the abuse of human rights in our country. And can you comment on the level of cooperation between law enforcement agencies and actually between countries as well? Is there any threat with Brexit? Um, I, I don't think this will be a matter for Brexit uh, in itself because this, um, the, the, the original part of this comes from a, a piece of legislation that was introduced in the USA, um, if I recall correctly, which uh, followed the... Uh, 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 followed the, uh, the whole principle of the uh, Magneski uh, Amendment, and that is um, uh, individuals who were involved in uh, what we've seen the abuse of uh, this individual's human rights in Russia, uh, who uh, had assets in other countries, is that uh, the fact that they were held in those other countries that allowed, uh, in this case, uh, America, allowed uh, American law enforcement agencies to pursue those particular assets. Um, of individuals who they believe were involved in the abuse of uh, uh, his individual human rights. That will be the case. So we don't, it's not a case of cooperation from another country. It will allow our courts here to make a determination on that based on the information that's laid before them and the assets that are held here uh, within Scotland or somewhere else within the UK. So in an entirely Scottish context, would you envisage that the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service Police Scotland would liaise with organisations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, to perhaps initiate inquiries? I've got no doubt they would use a whole range of different stakeholders in order to draw together um, uh, uh, an evidential base around uh, concerns relating to um, an individual and whether they've been uh, abusing uh, someone's rights in another country. Uh, and that would then be brought together and it would then be for the Crown Office to, uh, to determine how they would then take that forward. I'll ask Linda Hamilton to maybe, to, to maybe just expand in the process that the Crown Office would use, given uh, that Linda was previously at the Crown Office and dealing with some of these uh, types of issues. Uh, but they would use a range of different um, uh, information sources in order to put together a case that they could then take forward in the courts here in Scotland. So the Cabinet Secretary is absolutely right on that. Um, the Crown Office will liaise with international partners, as will Police Scotland, as required to get information uh, from that state should it be required um, for the purposes of the investigation. Now, what the Unexplained Wealth Order does do is allow further investigation, uh, strengthens investigation powers if, for example, that country is not willing to share information. So you can imagine that, that more hostile countries um, if, if there have been human rights abuses, may not want to share information with Crown Office or Police Scotland. So uh, the UWO powers just strengthen that um, and, and give a stronger investigative tool um, in order to get information collected at a Scottish level. And on uh, your Brexit question, um, that you know, the negotiations are very important in terms of making sure that Scotland is in at least as good a strong position as it is now. Um, in terms of investigations abroad and working with international partners. Uh, finally, if I may, it, it, it would, would this require a, a conviction to initiate this particular aspect? It, no, it will not require a conviction. It's civil-based. Yes. OK, thank you very much. <coughs> Stuart Stevenson. Uh, it's just a <coughs> technical point about timescale. Uh, I understand that it's proposed that House of Commons uh, be dissolved on Wednesday next week. I just uh, would be interested to hear whether we've had assurances from the UK government that they expect to complete the process on this uh, bill that's before the UK uh, Parliament before dissolution. We have. That's fine. Cool. Um, Council Secretary, I wonder, paragraph 17 of the supplementary LCM provides for the payment of compensation if property is wrongly frozen in relation to 
unexplained wealth order. Compensation would be paid by the Scottish ministers. Under the Proceeds of Crime 2002, is there provision for Scottish ministers to make compensation payments for wrongful orders? Uh, and if so, how much does the Scottish Government typically pay out in compensation per annum? So these, um, these are actually similar to the provisions we already have within the Proceeds of Crime uh, legislation. Uh, so it's a similar provision which is created. Uh, what would happen is that, um, uh, is that the individual would have to show the loss um, or the series default uh, uh, on uh, the part of, in this case, it was the Crown Office or Scottish Ministers in pursuing the issue uh, when they applied for an interim uh, freezing order. Uh, and that's a process that we already have in place for the proceeds of crime legislation. It will be similar for this legislation as well. So it's not a, it's not a new process. Um, it's uh, extending that process into this, this particular area of, um, uh, uh, of legislation. Uh, and do you have an idea how much Scottish Government do pay out in compensation per hour? Um, I'm, uh, I don't have that to mind uh, at, at the present time, uh, but it would be a ma it would have to be a matter to be raised in court by the by the applicants themselves. I don't know where Linda can expand on the extent of which that happens. Yeah, sure. So the compensation provisions that exist in the Proceeds of Crime Act already are. Um, they are to protect people whose property has been wrongly frozen. So they are very, very rarely used. People will ask for compensation sometimes, but the courts will decide whether that's appropriate or not. And it tends to be um, arguments maybe made around good faith or maybe made around whether the state has acted properly. Mm -hmm. So just because somebody has their property frozen and that property is thereafter shown to be legitimate does not necessarily create a case for compensation. Okay, thank you. Another intriguing bit of the LCM was, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could expand on the comments in paragraph 18 of the supplementary LCM about the increasing sophisticated ways in which criminals try to prevent the recovery of criminal gains, including the use of betting slips. Yes, um, well, as you can always imagine, individuals who are involved in this type of activity will seek to try and identify ways in which they can circumvent the existing uh, uh, provisions uh, that we have in the proceeds of uh, crime. And there was originally provision made within the, uh, uh, this particular bill to include casino chips, because that was being mm -hmm. used as a way in which to, um, uh, to try and circumvent uh, the proceeds of crime legislation as it stands. Uh, and, uh, uh, the Lord Advocate, the former Lord Advocate here in Scotland, raised the issue around betting slips being used. It's uh, these fixed odds betting terminals, uh, ticket in, ticket out processes, uh, which were being used as a way in which to actually almost, it's almost a way of uh, laundering cash, uh, uh, and uh, it had been identified by uh, the Crown Office here in Scotland as an area where they had growing concern that it was being used in order to circumvent the proceeds of crime legislation which is why we raised the issue, and I raised the issue with the, the UK government as a need for us to make sure we close down that loophole. Uh, and the amendments which have been brought in will assist us in doing that, uh, which will now allow these issues to be pursued uh, through the proceeds of crime uh, process in the way in which we can for uh, uh, other areas uh, where we're trying to pursue these types of assets. Yeah. But it's, a, it's an example of the way in which individuals who are involved in this type of criminality will always try to find loopholes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what we need to do is to make sure that we continue to close them down as and when they arise. It was particularly interesting having met with um, representatives from the gambling industry, just how alert they were and aware and, um, to the possibility of laundering and the kind of measures they put in place. So I was intrigued to see what that referred to. Just finally, for the avoidance of doubt, um, is the Cabinet Secretary and his officials quite satisfied you've had sufficient time to look at the provisions within the supplementary LCM? Uh, well, I think it would be stretching it to say we've had sufficient time. Um, to be perfectly frank, convener, it's been very difficult in dealing with this piece of legislation because of the very constrained time, fr time frame it had from the very outset. Uh, and there has been, um, uh, although we've been working hard with uh, officials at the Home Office around the areas that we've been uh, uh, looking to have addressed, uh, it has been a challenging time frame. It's certainly not what I would hold up as an example of how things should be done. Uh, between the two parliaments. 
um, and that has been added to further as a result of the calling of a general election, which has constrained the timetable even further. I suppose the main point is you are satisfied that the powers that are appropriate and sufficient um, and will be legally robust, even in the shortened timetable that you've had to look at the provisions? Well, as I said in my opening comments, the reason we want the committee in Parliament to support the, this particular supplementary LCM is because we think the provisions that are being taken forward which require the supplementary LCM are uh, very useful to a law enforcement agency in Scotland. So, although the process is not a good example of how it should be done, uh, the benefits that will come from what's intended within this legislation, I believe, are of uh, value to, particularly to the police and the Crown Office. All right. Thank you very much for that. And thank, can I thank um, the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending the committee today at very short notice and providing that information. The clerks understand, as I've already said, that the debate on the motion is to be taken in the chamber this afternoon. So are members content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the draft report on uh, the draft on the report, which should be published before the motion is taken in the chamber this afternoon. This will also know any comments from the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, which is meeting to consider the supplementary LCM at the same time as this committee. Are we agreed with that approach? Agreed. agreed. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, yes. Very short time, and we've heard about that. Uh, can I ask that you consult at least one other member of the committee just to make sure? I don't name who. Why don't I consult the deputy convener? That's fine. Thank you, convener. <laughs> Happy to do that. Okay. Um, I now suspend briefly to uh, allow the, the witnesses time to leave. Who is consideration of a negative instrument on damages, personal injury in Scotland, Order 2017, SSI 2017, oblique 96. I refer members to paper two and ask members if they have any comments. Nope. If members don't have any comments, then um, is the committee agreed that it doesn't wish to make any recommendation in uh, relation to this instrument? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Agenda item three is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting on 20th of April. I refer members to paper three, which is noted by the clerk, and invite Mary Fee to provide feedback. Thank you, convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 20th of April when it took evidence from the Scottish Police Federation, Unison Scotland and the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents on Financial Planning and Policing 2026. And the subcommittee heard that the unions and staff associations would like to be more involved in financial planning discussions and to see the views of their members taken on board. And the subcommittee hopes that this is the case going forward. And the next meeting of the subcommittee is scheduled for Thursday the 11th of May 2017 when it will hold a roundtable evidence session on local policing and the role of local police commanders. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do members have any questions? No. No questions then. We will now move into private session. The next committee meeting will be on 2nd May when we'll consider public petitions and our future work programme. And I, I spend briefly to allow members of the public gallery to um, depart. <laughs>